Okay, we are going to continue on in the book of Matthew uh, today, and we've been in this book for a long time. I think it's like 20 months, and we are going to probably be here another 20-ish months because what we're doing is we're committed to teaching every verse and every chapter, Um, but how we're doing it is we're going to break it up into series so that we can more adequately cover all the subject matter. Uh, Now, we're currently in a series called Upside Down, and in this series, we've kind of discussed the upside-down thinking of Matthew's time. Now, last week, uh, we talked about a very familiar text, the rich young ruler. How many people have heard of it? If you were here last week, you heard of it. (laughs) You guys are like going, I don't know, I slept through that, Pastor, I'm not sure. Okay, and in this text, Jesus was trying to teach a young man who was so consumed with wealth. He was trying to teach this young man that the only wealth that actually mattered was the wealth that they had for the kingdom. See, at that time, the Jews believed that wealth and prosperity was a sign of God's approval, and that anyone was, who was wealthy uh, was also in the middle of God's will, and they were righteous, and he wanted to dispel that myth. He wanted to let them know that, that true wealth is loving Christ and putting all the things of Christ first. And so it was kind of new, for even for the disciples to hear that. I mean, that kind of had to rock them a little bit, because they had always thought that too. When this young man came and asked Jesus, How can I have eternal life? It probably stunned them. They thought, you're rich. You probably already have that. Rich people are righteous. So it was was a big shock to them. So today we're going to discuss uh, a little bit of the confusion that still exists because the disciples heard this and they still have some questions. Now, not shockingly, Peter is going to be the one to ask the question, right? And anybody that has, has read the scriptures knows that Peter has a tendency to just say what's on his mind. Right, So today he's going to ask a question that probably all of us have asked at one time or another, and it's also the title of today's message, which is, what's in it for me? So let's jump right into this. Matthew 19, 27. Then Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Now, this question isn't as spontaneous and rude as it sounds. When you first hear this, does anybody think, man, that's rude? I mean, that's what I was thinking when I first heard it. I'm like, Peter, man, when are you going to learn to shut up? But... He had good reason for asking this. It wasn't that spontaneous because he and the disciples just wanted a little clarification, okay, about what he was talking about in verse 21. Look at this, Matthew 19, 21. Jesus told him, speaking of the rich young ruler, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Now, think about that for a second. They're listening to Jesus talk to him, and they're listening to what Jesus is saying, and he says, listen, if you sell out and put me first. And they're thinking to themselves, that's what we did. All of us left our jobs. All of us left our families. All of us gave up everything to follow you. And then he says, if you do that, you will have treasure in heaven. And all of a sudden, the kind of greedy side kicked in. And they're like, so what is this treasure in heaven? And that's really what they wanted clarification on. And what he was trying to explain to them was that Treasure in heaven means something that you gain through faithfulness in Christ that cannot be taken away. Something that you can't lose, that the market can't take away, it can't be stolen from you. It's a guarantee and a promise from God that not only will he bless you in this life, but there are special rewards waiting for you in the next life. Jesus wanted them to realize that, listen, it's not not about what you can get here. That's not the most important thing, what you can get here. Did you know that this will kill you, but do you know the average life expectancy is only 72 now? Do you guys know that, 72? 71 and a half for men. (laughs) I don't know why. 71 and a half for men, 72 for women. I just assume that they are nagging another six months before they notice we're gone. No, (laughs) I'm just kidding. Do not email me. Just kidding. But... When you think of 72 years in relation to eternity, it just doesn't seem like much, right? So one of the most discouraging mindsets that I've seen, and this is what Jesus was witnessing in the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the Jewish leaders, is that mindset that just focuses on this world, right? And people that do that, especially believers tend to be more self-centered and short-sighted. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. They're just really short-sighted, and they're a lot like the Jewish leaders because the Jewish leaders wanted to get everything they could get right now. They wanted it all right now. They wanted all the power, all the wealth, all the prominence, all the respect right now because they honestly believed that was the only real blessings from God was when you became wealthy. That was the only real blessing. When you had power, that was the only true blessing you got from following God. 
And what Jesus was trying to say is, listen, I don't want that for you. I mean, he needed his disciples to be the, I mean, the benchmark. They had to be the ones that went out to the world and, and displayed what true submission to Christ means and how that can benefit them. And he's like, you can't have this mindset if you're going to be the people that I want you to be. I don't want you to think about what you can have now. I kind of want you to play the long game. I want you to think about what you have coming. Basically, he's saying invest your time, talent, and treasure now, and then you'll be able to reap the benefits from that, not only in this life, but in his coming kingdom. Okay, because there are rewards for believers in that kingdom. And that's a very deep topic we won't get too deeply into today. But the greatest reward that a Jew could have was to know that they would serve in the kingdom of the Messiah. I mean, that's what they look forward to. And he's saying, listen, look forward to that and work to earn that. Because the thing the Jews dreaded most was to be the one that did so little that they had no position in that kingdom. And they basically sat the bench and had to watch. So he's saying, invest now and reap the benefits in the kingdom. But here's the thing. Sometimes that's tough to do. And let's be honest, most Christians today, I'm not going to say most, but many Christians today kind of think the way the Jewish leaders think. I mean, they live for what God can give them right now. They look at blessings as what they can have right now. And they dedicate their lives to trying to find the same kind of things the Pharisees did. They still dedicate their lives to trying to be the wealthiest they can be, to trying to have the most power, the most recognition, the most respect. They're dedicating their whole lives for those things. And what's so depressing about that is the more they try to fill their lives with those things, the less they find out those things just make them more empty. Because those things don't matter. They're temporary. Here's the thing that's really tragic to me. When people get sidetracked, especially believers, when we get sidetracked and we're worried about our, you know, our retirement more than we're worried about serving the Lord, we're worried about you know, how much we have in the bank or our great vacations or how big our homes can be, and you know, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. I'm just saying when that becomes our center of attention, that's what we focus everything on, it makes us miss the real blessings that God has given us every day that we're not paying any attention to. And here's some of those blessings. Did you know your family is one of the greatest blessings God has given you? It's one of the greatest blessings. Listen, parents, you can't rewind and go back and miss the memories. You can't do that. And yet the enemy deceives us into thinking, well, I'm working all this over time so they can have a better life. I'm doing all these extra things so they can have a better life. But the real blessing is at home waiting for you. That's more valuable than anything you can bring home. And what's most valuable to your children is having a mother and a father at home to love them and guide them. That's the most important thing to them. And so often we allow ourselves to be so sidetracked that we miss out on family or we miss out on friends and the great memories you can build with friends. Here's another thing we miss out on when believers get sidetracked like that. Have you ever witnessed God use someone to change someone's life? Have you ever seen that? Have you ever been the person that God used to change someone's life? The feeling of knowing that an all-powerful God who created everything in existence would use you to touch someone's life, there's no amount of money that can, that can buy that satisfaction. And yet we get so sidetracked that we miss those things which are really, really important. So Jesus wants to make a, a very big point of this. He wants them to understand, listen, it's not about what you can get now. It's not about you. And so he uses one of the most brilliant illustrations in this parable. And let's take a look at that. This parable, amazing how he just nails it. Starting in verse 28, Jesus replied, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. Now remember we talked, there's a difference between entering eternal life and inheriting eternal life. Both are used frequently in the scripture. Those who are going to enter eternal life are those who have believed. Everyone will enter the kingdom. But those who in inherit eternal life are those that get that promised inheritance that was given to Israel, which means they get to serve in that kingdom, right? So what he's doing here is he's telling them, listen, don't think about everything that you see with the, with the Pharisees and with the Sadducees. Don't think about that. Forget about the rich young ruler. Forget about those things. 
You know that kingdom that you've been waiting for your whole life? That's what you're investing in right now by following me. Actually, he's, he's quoting uh, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7, how many people have ever read the book of Daniel? If you want to see prophecy, if you want to see how much prophecy is unfolded right in front of us, read the book of Daniel. There's a ton of it in there because he is actually talking about the kingdom mentioned in Daniel 7, starting in verse 13. Daniel said, As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man sitting uh, or coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations uh, of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. So what he was saying is, listen, this is what your sacrifice has gained you. You will have position, not just get to enter it, not just get to serve in it. Because of the special sacrifice that you've made, you're going to have a position there. And that position was they were going to be able to sit on the 12 thrones and be there when he was bringing judgment upon the nations. Now, I know this might be wrong, but I, I can't help but feel really good about that. Because think of how Israel treated them. Think about that. They were ran out of every town they went into. All of them but one died a martyr's death. They were imprisoned. They were beaten. They were mocked. The people who followed the teachings that they, that they brought them were put in prison. All those things happened to them from the nations that they entered. And yet now when those nations come before God for their judgment, they will look up and see the people that they ran out, the people that they judged. Can you imagine? I know they're probably not supposed to feel good about that, but there's got to be a little happiness in that knowing that. Remember me? Hey. Remember me? No handcuffs now, my friend. Notice that? Yeah, who's getting tossed out now? No, I'm just kidding. He wouldn't say that. But he's saying that's the special reward that they're going to have. Invest now for the rewards you will have in the kingdom because whatever rewards you get from this world will go away. They're just, they're just not going to last. As a matter of fact, have you ever noticed that there are people, and, and we're all guilty of it sometimes, that we focus so much on what we're going to do when we retire? Having enough money to retire, and I've seen this time and time again as a pastor, you build up this, this huge nest egg, right? And you and your wife are going to enjoy that instead of enjoying your life along the way as well. And then when you get to the age where you can enjoy that, your health fails and you don't get to enjoy it at all. And then, God forbid, you leave this world and your wife gets to spend that with Biff, the health instructor she's been seeing. Yeah, that drives me crazy. <laughs> Anybody else think that's strange? I mean, I always think to myself, Lord, let my wife and I live to be 120 and 120 in one day so that she doesn't meet anybody that gets to spend that. No, but I'm just saying, it's so funny how many times I've seen what people have given up of the blessings of God. They've given up their time with their family. They've given up their time with their friends. They've given up the blessing of being used as a servant for something they never get. And what's even more tragic is I have been in hospital rooms where children are fighting over who's going to get the inheritance before their parents are even gone in the other room. Unbelievable. And I'm thinking, is that what you saved up for so that your kids could fight over what you have? Listen, I told my parents and my in-laws, listen, spend your last dime ordering a pizza from your deathbed. I haven't deserved any of your money. I don't want any of it. Right? Because... What you save up for should be investing in the kingdom so that you can feel the blessings of God throughout your life. And this is what he was trying to teach him. Right now, after saying this, you're going to notice he says something that sounds a little strange, and there's a reason why. Matthew 19.30, he says, But many who are the greatest will be the least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. So, I mean, imagine how this went down. He just told them how great they are. And how great they're going to be. Gets them all pumped up. Okay, it's worth the sacrifice. And then he follows it with, oh yeah, and people who are seen as greatest now probably won't be the greatest then. And they're probably going, what are you, what are you trying to say here? Are we doing something right? Or are we one of the greatest or not? Well, the reason he was saying this was he didn't want them to feel entitled. He didn't want them to feel like they deserved the blessings he was putting in their life. He didn't want them to feel self-righteous is pretty much what it boiled down to. Because one thing that I think a lot that the disciples forgot and a lot of believers today forget is that God sees everything. 
And when we think of somebody that's going to be rewarded big in heaven, we think, how many people think of Billy Graham? I mean, I don't care what denomination you are, you've got to admit, that guy was sold out. And I'm sure, his, I'm sure that his reward is going to be great. We think of the pastors, the good-looking ones. <laughs> We're not going to discuss that. But we think of, you know, of the leaders of great Christian organizations, right? We think of all those people. Those people are going to be way ahead of us in line. But in reality, God doesn't just see the things we do publicly. He sees the things we do privately. He sees all of those things, right? And, and I think often it's the things that are done privately for God that are the most rewarded because there's no question as to why they did them. They didn't do them so other people could praise them because they did them privately. They didn't do them to be seen as great by other people because no one knows they did those things. And let me give you some examples. I knew a person who used to take groceries to people who were struggling. Single mothers, people like that, would take groceries, and here's how they would do it. They would find out about it. They would buy just an immense amount of groceries to make sure they covered everything. They would take them and leave them at their doorstep and take off. No cards, no nothing. Just leave them at their doorstep. And people would ask him, well, didn't you want to stick around to let them know who brought it? And they said, no. I said, why not? He said, because I just wanted him to thank God for it, that he provided for him. You know, <laughs> that kind of chokes me up. I, I, I honestly think he may be ahead of a lot of people in heaven. What do you think? Because taking that time to reach out to those people in need and wanting nothing in return just to bless somebody, I just think that's amazing. How about that person that gives of their time to comfort those who are suffering, to sit with those who are struggling? And we all have somebody that pops into our mind. I, I hate to embarrass him, Rex pops into my mind. You know, those people that will go and sit at your bedside. Right. And Rex is going to be in line right behind me in heaven. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. No, but, but and, and, and we have other deacons doing the same thing. I mean, going and sitting with people in some of their worst moments. I've been there. I've done that. It's painful, and you cry with them, and you hurt with them, and you take that home with you. But you're not doing it so everybody in the church can see it. You're not doing it so that the world can say, oh, what a great comforter they are. You're doing it because you love God, and you want them to feel the love that God has put in you when they're at one of their most difficult times in life. And to me, that doesn't get seen a lot here, but I believe it's rewarded a lot there. And I believe God, those people are going to be so far ahead of everyone that we think will be the greatest rewarded in heaven that it's just unbelievable. The other people are those that just invest in the kingdom. There's a, I won't use a name here, but there was a guy one time, we were doing a project, and he really wanted to be involved. He had a super demanding job. He just couldn't be involved. So he calls me, and he said, Pastor, I, I don't know how to do this is the reason I'm calling you. He said, but I can't be there. I want to be there. He said, so tell me when they're working. And he had food brought in, catered into the, to the workers so that they would have food to eat. Nobody knew where it came from. I never told him. So he was getting no recognition for this, but in his heart, he knew that he was helping accomplish the work of God, even though he couldn't physically be there. And someone who's willing to do that, just I, I think that person is probably going to be ahead of me in heaven. I, just, and, I mean, I believe that. So sometimes it's not what everybody sees you do that's going to get you the greatest reward. It's what God sees you do for him and him alone that gets you great reward. And I think this is something that he really wanted the disciples to remember. Now, how he explains this, let's take a look at this. Matthew uh, 20, verse 1. Now, I love this because he uses a parable. And this parable is amazing because it nails it, right, about kingdom rewards. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. Okay, it's important that we realize that at this time, um, no work meant starving. Okay, that's what it meant. If you didn't work, you didn't, you didn't eat. The Bible talks about that. If you didn't work, you didn't eat. Okay, now there were no government programs that paid for your housing and your clothing. They just didn't have them. Here was the program, find work, get paid, feed your family. That was the program. If you didn't find work and get paid, your family went hungry. So it created a culture of people called day laborers. Anybody know what that means? Day laborers? It's people that go out every day and look for a job, 
They do that job, whatever it is. They pay them at the end of the day, and they use that to buy food. We hear that, and we think, gosh, that's so old-fashioned. That doesn't happen anymore. Listen, I've been in foreign countries on missions, and, and if you believe that that practice is gone, you need to go to the Philippines with us on our next mission trip. Because there are people all over the place looking for anything they can do for a day's wage to feed their family. So these people that, that they're talking about in this, in this parable were day laborers. They'd go out each day, and they would be paid at the end of that same day, and that's how they would, that's how they would feed their family. Now, it's also important to remember that there were no unions to protect them. There were no watchdog organizations. They had to completely rely on the honesty and generosity of whoever was hiring them. So do you think a lot of them may have got ripped off? You bet. It happened all the time, right? So now in the case we're talking about today, this wealthy landowner had a vineyard, and he was going out to hire the day laborers, and he promised them a denarius, which is one day's wage. It just equaled one day's wage. And they just had to take him at his word, and they went into the vineyard. Now, this, this practice of hiring the day laborer is the perfect illustration of how God's reward system works to those who serve. Okay, and let me explain that, because as believers, we have to make a conscious decision every day to make ourselves available to God for his service, every day. We have to make a decision that we are going to be his servants, and we are going to serve him and find a way to serve him every day. Like these day laborers, we have to make that choice every day. Now look at this, 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 10, says, as each one has received a special gift, what? We're terrible. <laughs> I'm just going to admit. Don't any of you try out for choir? Your timing is terrible. All right, let's try it again. <laughs> Has received a special gift? Employ it. Employ it in serving one another. Listen, this is huge. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Employ it implies that you put it to work. Okay, that you make a decision and you put it to work. If you want to be blessed, it's really simple. Choose to do what God asks you to do. Get busy serving him somehow, and he will bless you. It's, it's a pretty simple process. And unlike, you know, the workers of that day, we don't have to worry about our employer not keeping his end of the bargain. He's going to bless you if you do what you're supposed to do. That's what he's going to do, right? Because God makes promises. If we do what he says, he keeps those promises. This is so much like the lives of a believer, Right now, let's move on. Verse 3. At 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. <laughs> so he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever is right at the end of the day. Okay, so he'd already hired the early morning people. Now he hires the 9 o'clock people, and he says, I'll, I'll pay you what's right. Okay, verse 5. So they went to work in the vineyard. At noon, and again at 3 o'clock, he did the same thing. So at noon and 3 o'clock, he goes back to the marketplace and goes, I need more workers. And he finds people standing around. He goes, what are you doing? Nothing? Go, come here, I got a job for you, right? I'll pay you what's right at the end of the day. Verse 6, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, now remember, this is an hour before quitting time at that time. Okay, at 5 o'clock that afternoon, he was in town and saw some people standing around, and he asked them, why haven't you been working? They replied, because no one has hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. Okay, so he's get, it's payday, right? And he's going to start paying them, beginning with the person who started work at 5 o'clock. Okay? When those hired at 5 o'clock were paid, each received what? A full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you've paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. Okay, now, most people think you get paid by the hour. Okay, that's not the case here. He never said that. Right? That's not the case here. He didn't pay them by the hour. But I think it's fair to say that the people who were hired early in the morning were a little miffed when they saw that the people who only worked one hour got the same pay. Now, let's be honest. Don't be self-righteous. How many of you would have been mad? <laughs> there we go. Everybody would have been mad. You would have been upset. 
Because here they worked, you know, all day through the sun. These people work one hour and get the whole day's wage. So I think it's a kind of understandable that they would be angry, don't you? They'd be a little miffed, wouldn't you think? Right? But the landowner didn't do anything wrong here. Okay, and remember, Jesus is trying to teach something. So the landowner didn't do anything wrong here. He did exactly what he said he'd do. Matthew 20, starting in verse 13. He answered one of them, Friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage and take your money and go home? I wanted to pay the last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are, listen, so those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. Okay, after hearing the rest of that, you're thinking, yeah, pastor, that doesn't explain it at all. I'm still miffed, right? It doesn't explain it at all. Listen, think this through. They agreed on a wage, and he honored that arrangement, right? They had no right to question him, none. As long as he kept the arrangement he had with them, they were square. He didn't do anything wrong to them. The problem was perspective. See, all they were thinking about is what they had done, what they deserved for what they had done, right? So the owner wasn't thinking that way. See, if this vineyard, if the crops were not picked in this vineyard in time, all those grapes would spoil, all of them. Now, each grape in that vineyard was very important to him. That was his livelihood. So let's see this from a different point of view. He goes out early in the morning and he hires a crew. He looks at around nine o'clock and he's like, they're never gonna get done. They are never gonna get this done. So he hires some more people and they start working. So he comes back out again and he goes, they're still not gonna get it done. I've got to get every grape I can because what's left might be destroyed. So he comes out again at noon and again at three and five. And even at the end of the day, he looks out and he goes, there's two hours left and it's still not done. Every grape means something to me. Are you starting to see where we're going? And so he goes out to the last person and says, I'm desperate. I need people to get as many of these grapes harvested as possible before it's too late. Will you join me? And they go into the vineyard, right? So see, here's the difference. The workers were thinking about what they got done and what they deserve. The owner was thinking about the job getting done. And to him, he's like, listen, if you'll come out and help finish, I'll give you a whole day's wage. It doesn't matter. I'd rather pay you more than lose my harvest, right? That harvest was so, so important to him. What Jesus is trying to tell the disciples is, listen, stop worrying about what you get for your job. Stop worrying about just you and what you get. Worry about getting the job done. And let me worry about putting the people in the field to work beside you. Worry about getting the job done. Here's what Christ is worried about. Reaching every last person he can with the gospel before he returns. That's what he's concerned with, right? What was the vineyard owner concerned with? Getting every last grape before the time came that they would be destroyed. He's saying, get your mind right. Stop worrying about what you get now and start worrying about finishing the job, harvesting the field. There's only one thing I want you to do. Matthew 28, 18 tells us that. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Here's what Jesus was concerned with. Let's get as many harvested as we can. And he's saying, if you get distracted about what do I get, then you're not focused on what I am, and that is getting this job done. It's not about you. It's about finishing the harvest. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Worrying about doing the, the, worry about doing the best you can to make sure that harvest is finished. That's what we should be worried about. So basically, he just told him, listen, don't get full of yourselves. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Worry about this. Each one of you has a special ability that I want to put to work. Do it to the best of your ability so that in the end we have so many people in the kingdom of heaven that it bursts at the seams. Worry about that. He was trying to redirect their focus. 
because he knew there wasn't much time left. Now, here's something I don't think Christians believe or think about. I shouldn't say believe, think about much anymore. Did you realize that there's not much time left? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Most people think that one day God's going to just get up off the throne and go, oh, I'm sick of this. Everybody out of the pool. We're done. I think I'll just end this. Some people think that. They think that, you know, oh, if God saw what was going on here, I'm like, first of all, he does see it. Second of all, it's not going to change the end of time. Some people think that God is just waiting for us to make him mad enough. It's like, that's it. That's it. The Steelers didn't make the playoffs. Everybody out of the pool. (laughs) Right? That's not how it works. Here's how it works. Before the world was ever created, the day of Christ's return was set. It was set. Every day is one day closer to his return. Did you know that? Every day. So every day is valuable. We don't need to be worrying about anything other than trying to get the job done. Now, I've had people come up to me, and maybe some of you have too, and they want me to tell them something that will give them an indicator as to how close we are so they can wait for that and then get busy then. I have, they're like, so, Pastor, when's the end of, I mean, like, when will we know the end of time's close? Isn't this supposed to be like a two-headed dragon or something coming out of the ground? So when we see a two-headed dragon, now it's time for us to worry about getting busy. And I'm like, yeah, you need to read the whole book. I think you're mistaken there. They're like, what about the horses of different colors and stuff? I'm like, yeah, this isn't Lord of the Rings. You, you really need to focus on reading the whole book. That's not what it says. And they're like, well, then how will we know? I mean, what has to happen yet? What's the next thing to happen before Jesus comes back? And I go, well, if you want me to be honest with you, the only thing that has to happen next is him coming back. There's nothing else that needs to happen. And people say, when you say that, it scares me. Fix that. That doesn't scare me at all. Somebody heard Nate, Pastor Nate praying one time, and at the end of a lot of his prayers, he'll say, Lord, come and come quickly. And I had someone tell me one time, would you tell him to stop saying that? <laughs> I go, like, I am not ready for him to come back yet. Tell him to stop praying that. What if he answers that? I started laughing. I'm like, I don't think you get it. See, here's the thing. That's not a scary day to me. I'm excited for that. Sure, I I would love to have the time to reach as many people as I possibly can, but I'm also going to be happy when he calls me home. I'm excited for that day. The next thing to happen on the end time scale, in the scale of eschatology, the the next thing to happen is the return of Christ. I'm sorry, that's it. There's no more four-headed dragons and purple horses. I don't know where you guys are getting that stuff. That the, the next thing to happen is Christ is coming back. So when they say, well, how much time do we have? Not enough. Get busy. We don't have enough time. Because you always think you have time to reach that friend or that family member, but you're not factoring one thing in. We don't know how much time they have. People worry about how much time until the end. Your end might come before the end. Their end might come before the end. Have you thought about that? That's why we just need to be busy in the harvest, bringing as many people in as we possibly can. And it's really frustrating because when, when we start getting sidetracked with things like trying to amass as much wealth as we can and, and things like that and religion and all that stuff, then it distracts us from finishing the harvest. That's what dist- Even churches have gotten distracted. I mean, I'm not kidding you. Do you realize that there are churches that are battling over congregants? arguing about who took whose congregant. And they go, well, didn't so-and-so used to go to your church? And I said, well, if they go to yours, maybe they're getting fed better there. Maybe there's something you offer that I don't. But I just want them to be where they can grow. That's what's important to me. But they were yours. I'm like, no, they weren't. They were God's. Come on, man. (laughs) You know, we don't have time to argue about that foolishness. We don't have time to argue about denomination. We don't have time to argue about that stuff. We need to get in the harvest and get busy. All that is just distraction, stuff that pulls our minds off of Jesus. You know what's really sad is we've, as a, as a body of Christ, churches, Christians, we have become more worried about what we can get than what we've already received from God. When is the last time that you just spent the day praising God for what you already have? 
Did you ever think about that? When is the last time you didn't ask for anything for one day? Just one day didn't ask for anything. And in your prayer, say, just let your will be done, God. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my home. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the opportunity to live another day. Today, God, I'm not asking you for anything because I just want to praise you today for everything I already have. It'll change your whole viewpoint. It'll make you realize how quickly we get distracted like the laborers that were hired first. We forget that there's a job to be done, not just our job, the entire harvest. So here's the thing. Before I close, people come to me all the time and say, well, you always say we need to get busy and we need to do something and that we have special gifts, but I don't know what those are. Okay, here's how you handle that. Do whatever you can while you can, and then he'll direct you. He's not going to come up to you and take you by the hand and pull you out of your pew, out of your chair, and say, follow me, I'll show you what to do. What happened? He said, if you have a gift, employ it. It means, what can you do? Do it. What can you do? Does it mean encouraging somebody? Do that. Does it mean giving? Do that. Does it mean praying with someone? Do that. Maybe it just means roll up your sleeves and get to work on projects that need done. I don't know what it is. But do what you can while you can, and God will direct you and bless you for it. I promise you that. The problem is, is we are sitting around. That's an excuse for us not to get busy. That's what it is. It's an excuse. We're saying, God hasn't told me nothing yet. So I guess he wants me to sit here and watch Survivor. God's like, get up. Start doing something. I'll let you know. Do something, and I'll let you know. That's the greatest way to know what God has for you. So this whole, whole message, what I want you to take home from this, this whole entire, this is so much in here, was what Jesus was trying to say is, listen, what you can gain here can be taken from you in a second. But what you can gain from what you invest in the kingdom can never be taken. And it can change other people's lives. And you can be a part of something bigger than you that lives past you. If you have something to contribute to that, employ it. That's what he was trying to tell him. I'm going to go ahead and close there. I'm going to ask if you would to please bow your heads. If this is your first time, we always like to give an invitation. I don't do invitations where people come down or anything like that. I just believe that the Word of God is powerful. And as you go through a book, when you're teaching through a book and you see how the word of God touches different people's lives in ways you may not even intended when you prepared the message, you realize that, that God wants to speak to his people and he uses his word to do that. And if there's someone here who doesn't know where they stand with Christ, listen, we've all been there. But here's the most important thing you understand. I don't deserve to be a child of God. I am a child of God because of his grace. And the difference between you and I is his grace, not my righteousness. And if you want to know that you're his, that you're a part of his family, you just have to make that step. So if you want me to pray for you, just make eye contact with me, put your head right back down. Bless those people. I'm not going to point you out or email you or junk mail you. I just really want to pray for those people. Bless those people. Bless those people. If you're listening online, watching online, God knows your heart. But there's something big on my heart I, I, I want to pray about today too, and that's those of us who believe. I want to pray that we stop being so comfortable just waiting for the Lord to return. Listen, we all have people that need to hear. I just pray that whatever you have to offer in service to him, to make sure that the harvest is plentiful when he returns, I want you to do that. I want you to employ your gifts because there's just not a lot of time left. And no matter how much time's left, it's not enough. So we all need to be busy. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I, I'm amazed every day that you could love someone like me. I can't speak to anyone else's life, but I know how bad I was and how bad I am. Because your word tells us that there's none righteous, not even one. Lord, I know the parts of me that no one else knows and no one else sees but you. And when I know all those things, 
and yet experience your grace and love, I am amazed. God, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, no doubt there's all kinds of things blocking them from making that decision, fear and doubt. God, whatever it is, I just pray that you move it out of the way because you're not concerned with who they are and we know that. You're not concerned with who they've been and we know that. You're just concerned with who they want to be. I just pray if they could trust you and trust that what your son did was enough to guarantee their eternal life, if they could make that move today, your word guarantees them that they'll be a child of God. I just pray, God, if they make that decision, they contact us so that we can walk with them in their journey. If, if you're watching online and you're a long way from here, find a good Christian organization or a good Christian friend that you can, you can talk to about your new decision. But for those of us who've already believed, God, it, it is so easy to get distracted and to just rest in who we are. God, I just pray that we never get comfortable, that we never stop seeking to do your will in any way possible so that this harvest can be plenteous. Let us have hearts that ache for those who don't know you and have a great desire to introduce you to them. We just pray, God, as we leave here, you would keep us safe. Let us live what we profess. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, God, we just pray that that we would all come together and give you all the praise, honor, and glory you're so worthy of at least one more time. We just thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.